Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. We are in the process of getting the sound on the videos turned down so that we can have one conversation instead of um, being immersed in uh, all sorts of variety of sounds and activities. So um, I'm really thrilled to be here and uh, have this conversation with Cheryl. We're going to do sort of like a moving walkthrough. And um, feel free to ask questions as we go. It's not intended to be kind of a you know, one-way conversation. It's supposed to be a dialogue. So I think we should start off by uh, talking about the fashion works, one of which I am wearing. Um, and if you were here last night, Cheryl was wearing one, and some of the staff members here were wearing them too. So um, uh, I love the way, if you guys look around just for a second, the way the mannequins are posed. They're sort of like all of you, some of them you know, hands crossed, you know, on the left, on the right, um, they're engaged, and, and I think they're intended to sort of welcome you, and, and that's one of the things about your um, fashion work is that it's totally accessible. Um, it's priced for the everyday. Um, it's pr priced like fashion, it's not priced like art, and um, one of the things that I think we'll talk a lot about today is how you represent the idea of both and instead of either or. Um, and um, so let's start off by asking you about this particular fashion line which we commissioned for the show and some of the imagery included on the works. Great, I'm happy to. And I think both and really well caps encapsulates this particular uh, collection and uh, collection that I did. Um, I uh, discovered a company called Print All Over Me, which is um, kind of a, a social media um, consumer friendly, direct to consumer um, company where um, anyone can upload a JPEG and apply it to a selection of garment silhouettes and order that garment and sort of have your own customized uh, garment that is kind of ready made. So I. Uh, sort of like to call that a refashioned ready-made because you're um, participating with the consumer object and you're sort of creating it as much as you're consuming it. And so for this one, I um, all the design, the, the motifs that you're seeing come from um, photographs of um, air conditioning grills that uh, they kind of window units that stick out on the street in New York that get tagged and, and, and uh, scratched on. And um, so I took those uh, archive of photos that I had um, and I uploaded them. I picked out two silhouettes, one t-shirt and one silk slip dress. And those are kind of what I call standards because they are um, just with the pattern on the simple garment. But what I mean by the and, and, <laughs> is that once I got them to the studio, I decided I could take them to the next level by um, upcycling them, um, cutting them, dyeing them, uh, macrameing them, and just kind of turning them into unique pieces. But the methods I used are kind of, um, you know, what people always do with their clothes, um, cutting off the, the neck out of a t-shirt, uh, bleaching or ripping jeans. So I kind of feel like, you know, the accessibility is like my accessibility, like what I can, can do with a pair of scissors. So it's not like couture, nor is it like a sculpture. I, I want it to be worn and, you know, partied in and washed and worn again. So, you know, that's why I, I sort of, um, yeah, the accessibility is really important to me. So for a long time, uh, artists couldn't really be interested in fashion. I'm making like gross generalizations, but um, artists couldn't really be interested in fashion and, and be taken seriously as well. Uh, and also for a long time, artists couldn't be moms and be taken seriously as well. Um, and so there, there are a lot of these kind of, um, I would call them, severely antiquated notions, which are luckily now sort of broken apart, um, but a lot of them sort of apply to you. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your personal practice mm. and all the different facets that come together to make you know who you are as, as an artist. Well, you know, I, I think it's really important, you know, yeah, that binary thinking is kind of getting us in a bad place that I, I don't see how we can be satisfied with those limitations. And, you know, certainly, you know, it's like, the kind of stuff that you hear, well, I heard, you know, as a young woman coming into art school and, um, you know, walking into the painting studio and then hearing painting is dead. And you're like, you know, just when I got here, <laughs> you're saying it's irrelevant. So it was, you know, it, it, 
that's where it starts, you know? And then it's like, yeah, no, you, um, th you know, dare to have a child at your own, you know, the risk of, you know, being ever taken uh, uh, seriously or having time to do anything else except for that. It's, uh, or, you know, but even on a more um, subtle level, when I started to do video as a way to think about painting, um, I found I, but still insist on doing painting, I kind of found I would split an audience because the people who, and this is more back in the 90s, people who were in favor of technology and art and cutting edge uses of, um, of media weren't so in favor of paint on canvas. And people who loved paint on canvas were, could be dismissive of art that employed, you know, consumer technology. So it was like, come on, can't we get together on this? But I guess for me, like, there's always artists who are load stars in front of you who have done these things defiantly and despite. And one of them, for me, in terms of painting and video, was Warhol, because, you know, Andy was making films, and some of his best films were in the periods where he was making his most well-known paintings. And maybe that, it, it was, why wasn't that considered absolute precedent? Um, and, because for me it certainly was. So, I, I guess I'm just, you know, um, I don't look, you know, maybe I don't come off as the most like rowdy and defiant person, but when it comes to, you know, that, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I don't want it, I don't want that. Either or. It's never really worked out for me. I always want both. Yeah, who doesn't, right? So I, I'm watching the TV show Billions. I don't know if anyone has watched that. But uh, the moral of the one that I watched on the plane on the way down here was life is short, so have everything. Right? Do it all. Right? Yeah. So do it all. So when you look around um, this exhibition, uh, there are things that really unify the work. So even though there's video and there's fashion and there are paintings, there are things that pull it together. One is your use of color, another is your interest in pattern making, um, another is in the in materiality of the fabric. Um, so wh what do you see when you look around? Is it all unified? Is it, is it, are you having it all? <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's funny because, you know, I think, you know, when this, um, exhibition was in Aspen, in the, uh, your home space and your home institution at Aspen. Um, it was really galvanizing because I felt the curation um, really allowed me to kind of put a foot out there as a painter because um, there weren't that many videos in that iteration. And so, you know, even though I'm saying like have it all, I was really appreciative of the way that you shaped the show at, to highlight the painting practice, which is kind of in the public eye a little bit dragged behind. And then the risk taking, which felt very risky to be like, we're bringing mannequins with clothes, with dresses, like in, in the, um, the gallery. So as much as I felt like so uh, encouraged to like be out there as a painter, I'm like, oh my God, am I shooting myself in the foot by now showing dresses? like. I can't, you know, am I, am I winning and, and losing, you know, at the, like running these risks. But, you know, here in this, but it, and it didn't turn out that way. It was a really nice and exciting balance, I thought. But then when I got here, because of the difference of the space, um, there was this ability to create sight lines through. And I think that has been a real pleasure to help with the inter understanding of how one body of work flows into the other. So what I see in this exhibition that I'm really pleased with is um, the, the different uses and deployments of patterns that really talk about surface. And this kind of, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, um, you know, ways people dismiss ambitions. And I mean, one thing for me was, you know, even in our language and of English, when we talk about something being skin deep or just on the surface, we don't mean that in a nice way or an encouraging way. We mean it as like a put down. But I'm really interested in that skin deep surface. So whether it's the, the shallow surface of, you know, 
someone making uh, their mark on an air conditioning grill, which is just scratching into something existing and kind of destroying it. But it's a very, it, it's about like changing that surface, putting your impression on that surface um, as a street artist. Or, you know, if it's about like, you know, the, the surface of the track suits and, and their relationship to, to the body, um, the sort of subtle, shallow space that's created by the gingham going under and over, that kind of virtual space that is very shallow and thin, but a space nonetheless. I'm, I'm sort of interested in the way, or, or the, the, the shiny surfaces of the plexiglass covered paintings that maybe f remind you of the, the screen on the phone. So I, I kind of feel like, you know, there's a something hopefully people will see about playing around with the surf with our surface world, you know, and how it, yeah. So interesting because you just said something that, that uh, so we we've, we've done a couple of talks together in a couple of different places, and and um, one of the things I love about working with artists is every conversation is new. You know, it's never canned because um, there's always something new to learn, and so. You just talked about like dismissive language, right? And people kind of dismissing other people. Um, and I think part of that is, um, in order for that to be able to be allowed, someone has to be seen, right? Or, or a way to counter that kind of dismissiveness is to, is to uh, demand that someone is seen. Um, and, and I'm struck by uh, that about your work, right? Um, it, it somehow, it uses some of these uh, associations like of, you know, clothing or color or whatnot, which maybe could have been previously dismissed as not serious mm -hmm. or, um, but, but it's demanding that kind of attention um, in a new way. And, and that is very, um, it's very both kind of like punk and subversive, um, but it, it's also very, I think at this point, like feminist and strong. Uh, and so I wonder what your thoughts are on, on those kind of, um, on that nomenclature. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I very much so, you know, even, I mean, it, sometimes it's even like descriptions can be limiters in the way that if it's when I sort of said, oh, well, I'm doing these clothing projects now, and then people would come up to me and say, oh, so I hear you're a fashion designer. Right. And then I'd be like, yeah, no. Um, I'm working with clothes because I like to wear clothes and I, and I can make clothes because I can, I wouldn't be making these clothes unless I could kind of buy them, you know, and then remake them. And it's more about, like, for me, the interaction of, um, well, if I take this print and I put it on this garment, what will that say about each? And, you know, it's that kind of playing with, um, you know, seeing, I don't know, just sort of re recomposing the everyday, like mm -hmm. to to comment on, like, um, you know, how we're, how our surfaces, like what what they say about themselves, even, you know, what they say about us, um, because certainly, you know, I mean, I keep going back to the phone and like its role in our life, like, you know, it, it's like, it it is like our relationship is to is so intimate. And so maybe you know alienating at the same time, but it's like you know that's that's the space we live in, that's the world we navigate, and I feel like there's got to be a way for art to talk about that without like necessarily just trying to describe it, which might limit it, but kind of like demonstrate it. Do you know what I mean? It's more like demonstrating than describing, and so maybe I even mean like you know we're talking about just getting out there and doing stuff, you know. So you could even play around with, you know, what it means to demonstrate. It's like showing. It's like showing it, you know? And whether that's in protest or defiance or it's just teaching somebody. You know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, demonstrate. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you do wear the clothes and people do wear the clothes and I'm wearing the clothes and that's sort of how I started. Um, and you uh, are in the majority of your videos, right? Yeah. Uh, so that that idea of um, never asking someone to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself, right? Um, you know, is that idea of kind of being 
uh, the demonstrating but instructive or leading by example or building the world or the interaction or the relationship that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny because I didn't think I was going to talk about this video, but back in the booth back there, there's a video that's called Stop Me If You Think You've Heard This One Before, and it's me and my older son, who was like nine or ten at the time, and talking about demonstrating, I said, I got obsessed with this, uh, with Viva, the Warhol superstar, and um, I uh, said to my son, okay, we're going to watch this Warhol movie, and there's a scene with Viva and Taylor Mead, and I said, you do what he does, and I'm gonna do what she does. And so we're watching the film, and I had headphones on, and I'm trying to recite her monologue, and he's doing what Taylor Mead does, and he was at, you know, kind of making, mocking Viva, and looking bored, and sort of wandering off. I did pay him ten dollars a take, <laughs> so you know. But it was it was it was. I mean, and my my friend who's like a Lacanian psychoanalyst, he's like, interesting. The child witnessing the mother's pleasures, <laughs> you know. And I was like, okay, but it's demonstrating something. Like whether it's you know, and there were so many relationships going on because there was like me and him, and even you know the child of an artist. His kind of like, you know. Even at 10 years old, he's kind of like tolerance of like <laughs> mom's eccentricities that are like no big deal to him. And yet he was willing to play along for $10 a take. Um, and so it was like this sort of thing is in a lot of these videos. And he's all, my other son Cassius is in a few of them too, but you know, they've always been so kind of to, uh, playfully tolerant you know, of my demonstrations. <laughs> and um, I, I, it's, but it is part of our relationship in a funny way. Yeah. So I was thinking about the artist's hand in your work. And, uh, you know, it, you can see the hand um, in the cutting. And you talked about the scissors and the braiding or, you know, the macrame, which is here. Uh, but I was thinking about the, the newest paintings in the show, which are these um, track suits that you search for online and then bought and then placed on your studio floor and uh, photographed and then you know printed on fabric and dyed and stretched and, and uh, so there are things in the show that that um, are representative of, of time and your effort right so I mean it, my guess is that you didn't pick the first tracksuit that you saw right you have to look at a lot of them you have to evaluate them um, so your your presence in the show is through some of these kind of non-traditional ways of working, uh, and I wonder where you think you f you find yourself uh, in the work. Yeah, um, interesting question. Wow. Yeah, I, I kind of um, one of my favorite movies is this Agnes Varda film called The Gleaners and I, and she really examines this very old-fashioned practice and kind of old-fashioned world of, word of gleaning, which is like the people who go behind and pick up what's left. So it's like the gleaners are like in the, like the old-fashioned like harvest sense, and I guess it's like is an agrarian word, and they come behind and pick up what's left that like the first pickers didn't get, or maybe the, the ones that the, for the pickers left behind because they were like the least good products, or you know, the things that are falling off the cold truck and so there's this sort of like notion of it that it's like a, maybe a, a, an act that like of desperation or sustenance and survival and difficult conditions but you know it also is like flea market shopping you know but what was attractive to me about that gleaning is it's like you're you are kind of a picker but you're noticing and you're picking what others are leaving behind or what others don't think is important, you know? And I feel like, you know, eBay is like a gleaner's paradise, right? And so there were so many hours of gleaning on eBay. And at first I was doing it, you know, because all the flea markets in New York were dried up because of the real estate boom. And so you could only scratch that itch online. And I was also, I started a Tumblr as like kind of a, a notebook of images, like an archive of images. So I was constantly trying to look for images, gleaning images to feed my Tumblr. And through this kind of act of gleaning, um, I, I stumbled on these tracksuits. And I'd been previously kind of interested in this idea of junk space, which I guess 
there's going to be a talk on here later, but this idea that comes from architectural theory of, well, you know, how do we describe our contemporary buildings, you know, that are kind of both extravagant and sort of pathetic, you know, where like, that are enabled by like, um, escalators and, and, and mezzanines and endless plate glass and anyways I just found that descriptor of contemporary space something I kind of latched on to as like a way to compose because you know I was like oh the, the modernist grid the Greenbergian flatness the cubism like it's not really like describing how an image comes together in like 21st century space so the tracksuits kind of appealed to me as like the body turned into junk space, like a bunch of geometric shapes that like didn't really describe the body, but were definitely like it implied or placed on. So, and even the space of how they were photographed, like flat on the floor with like light flares and weird, weird photographic kind of mistakes. So they just struck me as very useful for a lot of things I wanted to talk about. So they kind of became like the substrate uh, of the painting. And um, I liked the way like that the, that they kind of seem, um, they almost don't seem whole. Like they seem eaten into, like the way the negative space like eats into the space on the banners, you know, like that the, like there's a kind of a, of a, of a barely, it's not like shattered, like a shattered glass, but it's kind of barely held together. M you know, m maybe uh, something like, you know, the, the air conditioning grills, like they're, they're, they're destroyed, but they're made more beautiful. Like, like something about that, like barely, like holding together, falling apart, destroyed, but made more beautiful. Like it, 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 it's what, yeah, it's like what my eye is gleaning, like that thing on the floor that nobody else wants that I'm going to be like, oh, that's great, you know, at the, you know, yeah. So um, one of the bodies of work that's included here that wasn't in Aspen are these banners. Uh, and, and I was saying last night how much I like the relationship between the banners uh, and these, uh, what do we call them, the process? Those are like early resist. Okay, so yeah. the early resist paintings. Um, and so both the same materials, right, was used to make exact like same. two yeah. totally different series. Um, so you can see that. But then, um, and, and I was thinking about, I, I'm going to have a question in here, but um, you were talking about the presentation in Aspen really emphasizing being a painting show. And I was looking around and thinking like how little paint, actual paint there is in this show. Um, and so that's also a, a, a nice thing to at least just like lay on the table, mm -hmm. which is this kind of expanded definition of what painting means as well. Um, so that's kind of like the both and because it takes a two dimensional form and it hangs on the wall, then it gets to be a painting even though it might be absent of paint. But um, I thought it would be interesting to ask you how you chose the people that are represented on the banners and, and who they who they are to you. Yeah. Well, um, the, the people on the banners are, you know, just from a long list of artists, entertainers, designers, creative people, actors, um, that just I love, you know? I mean, people that mean a lot to me that are in kind of my own personal pantheon, like, you know, uh, just musicians that I've really, I, I listen to all the time in the studio, films, filmmakers, um, and so I, I have this ongoing list. And I, I was kind of inspired by, um, there's a favorite piece of mine by um, Lee Harvey, uh, by Singamar Polk, um, of Lee Harvey Oswald, and it's all done with the, you know, the, the dots and the print matrix um, that get blown up, so you see every individual dot, and they're referred to as roster dots, and so I was like, well, I can, I have this polka dot fabric, pun for <laughs> Singmore polk, polka, and I'm like, oh, instead of notorious people, I'm kind of tired of the notorious, I want to do people that are inspiring and that I personally love. I mean, you know, one could say, oh, well, Yoko Ono, she's pretty notorious, but, you know, um, yeah. And, and also, like, completely inspiring and revolutionary artist that I love. So, you know, um, Asti, Sonia Delany, I, I just did that one. That's probably the last one, just, you know, because it was like, oh, wait, someone did serious clothing, patterning, and was an amazing painter. 
in the beginning of the 20th century. So it's like, again, le you know, legacy. It's, it's looking for those people who did do exactly what they wanted to do. And, um, you know, and, and are those examples that, that, you know, are inspiring. Um, there was something else that you, you said, I, I forgot. I was talking about the, the Oh, the paint, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, I, I kind of mentioned the like, thinness and surface and stuff. And I think, you know, one reason I, um, uh, you know, since I had all these thoughts about like the surface and the 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 the, 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 the skin deep, the kind of thin depth, um, that I thought, well, I really want to push the paint into the surface so that it's not just merely on the surface, but it becomes the surface. It's it's indistinguishable from the surface. So that's why I kind of started using dye because I thought. Well, that's the thinnest paint, um, it, and and it's the painting itself has to be immersed in it. it. It can't just be applied. So it's so again, it wasn't like on the surface. It was like in the surface. It was like you know trying to press everything, you know, almost to the level of a screen itself, where you know it, it, it's like when you like I always bring up the example of the. Um, you know, now it's very familiar, but when they first presented like iPods to do your signature when you bought something, and I always was like, it was so dizzying to me just kind of thinking about and the spatial relationship there because like I'm making the mark, but the mark is coming up at me, so I'm kind of meeting the mark, and and my touch is like triggering it, but it's not making it. In a, it was just like. It still kind of freaks me out. I mean, now we're used to it. But I found the first time I did it, I was like, what? You know, and um, it didn't feel like official. You know, it felt like just kind of woozy. And um, so it's that kind of thing, like dealing in like screens, that I was like, how do, you, how do you get that into art? But to me, it's like, how can you not get that into art? Because that's our world. Do you know what I mean? So. Uh, I'm struck by the placement of some of the objects in the space in terms of like being in our space, right? Or this idea of how art comes into the world. So you have the monitors on the ground. You know, we've made reference multiple times to the mannequins. I'm looking specifically at the banners, uh, which I know um, can be printed at any size. Um, so here they're printed, you know, to go from the very top of the wall. And these are really high ceilings, um, and oftentimes people don't really look up. Right, you kind of look at your eye level, or and, and we hang art for the most part, like at this kind of assumed um, center line of, of vision. Um, but this goes all the way to the top, and then it also bleeds out into the space, you know, of um, of like the physical presence, right? Standing, sitting, um, being on, and um, and then th that kind of scale jump with some of the smaller works, particularly just to their left, uh, and. That, that for me is another of kind of like the both and, like fill your peripheral vision and then bring people in for this very intimate experience. And um, how, how important for you is that kind of physical interaction where people are kind of you know, leaning into and pulling away from based on what they can see and what fills their vision space? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you know, because it's like, I mean, I guess, I mean, one reason, you know, I gotta take it back a couple of steps, like, you know, one reason that like, it was so frustrating to um, originally for me to like approach painting was um, because I had so many d demands for it. Like I wanted it to be a picture, but I also wanted it to be a way of thinking, but I also wanted it to be an object hmm. and also an action. And you know, so there was so many like. It, it's really hard when you're a young artist and you have all these demands for what you want it to be to just think of one thing that's going to fulfill all those demands. So it is like a trial and error, like, well, let me try this and let me try that. And, and for me, a lot of it was like, I, I didn't know it at the time, but like acting it out, like acting out the gesture, acting out the mark, you know, and filming it because I didn't know how to get it into the painting the way I wanted to. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, like I really, you know, when I look at say, I don't know if people are that familiar, but one of my favorite, you know, kind of moments in art is 
the French um, 1960s, 70s um, movement that's collectively known as support surface. Mm -hmm. So it's like support, the support of the canvas and the surfaces. And to me, they're kind of, you know, again, a case of and, and, and you know, and, and, where um, these guys, mostly guys, were like, really inheritors of the legacy of Matisse, but then they had all American conceptual and performance art to deal with uh, that they were, you know, getting the influence from of like, you know, the radical art that was going on in, in, in America and Germany and Japan in terms of like performance and people's bodies. And, and like when you look at what they came up with when they put all these things into the mix, amazing like colorful but also weird as objects. and. So it's like they, they, they got it. Like they got to make beautifully colored Matissean paintings that also felt like strange and rigorous objects that also felt performative. And like, so it's, and maybe it was because of their vantage point as like artists in the south of France, like away from the center, that they got time and space to figure this out. So it's stuff like that, like that, you know, when bringing all this list of demands and thinking, how am I going to shoehorn this all into one thing? It, it, it takes time, you know? And I think that's, you know, the kind of meandering through the different bodies of work to try to find that satisfaction. So do you think there's humor in your work? I hope, because, you know, we, we, yeah, we're like, you know, we want, that's, we've had, I think, a little bit glancing somewhere in this conversation. It's like, you know, I mean, this is, you know, maybe it's like, you know, a thing that, you know, how do you, you know, be, you know, express your sense of humor, but still be taken seriously, yeah. like, you know, how can, you know, you go on about, like, how fabulous fashion is, but still have people think you're just not a ditz, you know, how do you like, you know, drag your kids to an opening <laughs> and have them laying on the floor bored and like, you know, sabotaging you and then trying to be like, yes, I'm an artist holding my own hair. You know, like, how do you do all that? You know, but I guess, you know, some, you just, you just gotta, you know? And I mean, I, I love like word games and I'm really like, n you know, I can nerd out on like, you know, the kind of Duchampian spinning of, you know, words into, you know, their um, homonyms and the, so puns, you know, I like all that. So I, I try to like bring that into the work and, you know, I, I guess, like for me in the video, like I'm not like a performer as much, you know, like I would not be on stage, but when it's me and the camera, like I would feel a little bit more free to like kind of just go there. So um, I think more in the um, in the video that you know kind of found a place. But you know, even hopefully, like like a lot of people ask me about the title, like girls, girls, girl. What is it? I'm like, it's all of them. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny too. I, I actually think the um, paintings with the uh, horizontal, um, or sorry, diagonal ruffles are really funny, you know? I mean, it, it's like, what? You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think a big part of humor comes from the insertion of the pause. Um, and I think we live in a time where everyone wants to like understand everything all the time because no one wants to like feel dumb or like they missed out on something or there's like something being pulled over on them and you know contemporary art falls prey to that sometimes right where it's for sure like the emperor's new clothes thing so, yeah yeah so this idea of the both and is I think both. very uh, it can be even more disruptive because it makes people even more uncomfortable because it's like well I thought it was that and you're saying it's like that and that, but like how can it be this if it's that? And it's like, yeah, like exhale and just like accept it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the authenticity piece. It's like, yeah, you can give a talk, uh, you know, while your kids are in the space, you know, or you, you can do these different things. So Well, it's tolerance, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that would be great, <laughs> right? You like tolerance of the slippage, yeah. tolerance that it goes both ways and you know that this is the field and this is the running room and we have to be tolerant because you know y y like it's not a threat 
You know, it's just the field. It's the expanded field, and you know, like with more, like one of you know the favorite uh, ma mantras, you know, of like here comes everybody. Well, I guess you know it didn't work out so great on Twitter, you know, but like the idea that you know we're 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 tolerant of each other's experimenting because like you know, all these different combinations are coming up and the more people who are recombining, like, the more possibilities. It's like an increase in possibilities rather than a diminishment of possibilities. But there has to be tolerance so that those, yeah, so that's not seen as a threat, but like as pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would argue the opposite, which is um, there is a benefit to tolerance because it is a threat. Um, mm -hmm. And I think all these things are threats and I think that's what's awesome. You know, um, I think the, uh, the, the threat and the discomfort um, is where the power comes from, so. Well, I mean, I could speak to the, like, that, and I take point taking, because like, you know, when I was making those paintings that like, you know, you're talking about lack of paint, you know, and I'm a lover of painting, like, I love it. I'm, I'm like, I did not come here, you know, to, to dismiss or destroy painting or, or limit it, like, I came here to participate in it, and so, you know, but when I was making those paintings where like, um, I just, uh, it's um, gingham fabric on board, and I was just like, um, thought I was gonna make something else, and I put the glue down, and I stuck it, and then I turned around and walked away, and then turned around and went, I think that's it. Like, cause the glue dried funny, and I was like, it's like, like, you know, you know, what I was talking about earlier about the surface and the body and the space of, the intimate space of the body and the skin. Like the idea that, you know, you could make the painting look like it had sweat stains, like pit marks. You know, to me that was like, yeah, it's kind of dirty. It's kind of gross, but like, even it was like, well, it's about that, um, that subtle differentiation makes the mark. Like the subtle shift in like, you know, whether, yeah, like in the case of, yeah, body temperature starts to um, have an index, have a presence, have a mark making, you know? And that that became like, oh my God, this painting looks like a sweat stain um, because the glue dried darker. Um, but I was like, wait, I think that's what I'm after. Well, I like that notion a lot of, you know, what is enough? Yeah. Like how do you know when you're done? So. Um, I, I feel like I need to ask you about the sound in the videos since we, you know, silenced most of them, but then every once in a while, like, some, you know, there's like a coughing or, you know, it's, um, it's like a phantom limb. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about the sound in, yeah. in the work? Yeah, um, like, yeah, the sound is really important to me and, and you know, I hope people, you know, will, m when it goes back up, if you can't stick around, maybe come back or something and, and you know, because the sound is very important. I mean, um, uh, I think two influences there was definitely like looking at, um, and, and at one point in time I had a studio that was right near Anthology Film Archives in New York, so whenever it wasn't going well, I would like, I'd just go to Anthology and see a classic movie. Um, so I saw my share of Godard films. And you know, Jean-Luc Godard, a uh, French uh, filmmaker, has a theory of um, sound and image, and that you know, but it's always a plus between, you know, sound plus image, because that's what film is, it's not, it's sound plus image. And so he really talks about how, you know, they weave, they can separate, they can diverge and come together. So I think I was really, you know, I didn't go to film school or do any study, but I kind of learned on my own. Um, so taking the point from Godard that, you know, the sound and the image don't need to correspond, and, and the, the sometimes that the, the sound can, can really push the imagery in a place that it needs to go emotionally. Um, and then I'm lucky because um, my husband, Kenneth Goldsmith, is um, used to be a DJ at an alternative radio station. He's a giant music collector. Um, he does ubu.com. So he's really finding weird and interesting sounds. So I had kind of a sound library at my fingertips of, you know, just stuff I could use. And, and um, so I, I, I really, like, try um, to sort of push the sound in, and, you know, whether it's appropriated sound. I mean, in the piece back here, Blood Sugar, it's just uh, an opening riff of a recent P.J. Harvey song, just looped, you know. So it could be a loop 
it could be, it's rarely me speaking, even though I talk a lot, um, but um, it was, and, that, and that's probably the reason why I did the Viva monologue as a sound, because it was like, that was one of my own things that was like, when I get nervous, I talk a lot, nervous chatter, and I was like, it was sort of exercising like the thing I don't like the most about myself, and like, you know, thinking like, oh, well, all those Warhol superstars, they, Andy didn't say that much, but the superstars never shut up. <laughs> so I was kind of like, you know, being both, you know, both like um, the reasoning why. <laughs> being both. Um, all right, let's have some questions. Let's have some dialogue. I said we would move, but everyone kind of seemed fine. So, and we could kind of see most things from here. But and we're mic so it's real good. So. The artwork? The art world, sorry. Oh, the, the art, art world. Tolerant of and and. Uh, I mean, it can be rough out there. <laughs> it can, especially, in, I mean, you know, New York is my home. I've been living there 30 years and making work, you know, and it can be the most friendly place with a lot of supportive people, and it can also be a place where you know, people treat you like a jerk until someone on the food chain higher up tells them not to. <laughs> so, you know, but that's New York and I think it's ever been thus. And so, you know, you just, uh, like there's, you know, I remember, I don't know if you know, the Matt Connors, um, who's a, a friend of mine and a great painter, like when he first came to New York, I remember we were, some people were talking about how hard it is and Matt went, la, 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 la. He's like, I don't want to hear it, you know. But, I mean, I think that, um, well, you know, I can complain a bit. I mean, you know, I, I think sometimes, like, like, people don't have time to be confused, you know? So if you do bodies of work that are different, sometimes it's just like, I don't have time to figure you out. Like, call me back, you know, when, when the jury's decided. So, it can be that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, yeah, it's like, if you're willing to listen, lots of people will tell you what not to do. <laughs> but it's just like, be like Matt, just like, la, 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 la. <laughs> like, don't listen. <laughs> uh, I've started speaking recently about um, being now a museum director for a while, but um, having been a curator for a long time and, uh, and being told by, you know, female colleagues of mine that it was okay that I had one kid, but I couldn't have two, you know, and being told actually by my a boss when I was a curator by a museum director that like the second kid was like a no-go, um, but I have two kids. Um, and, uh, and that's actually when I decided to be a museum director um, and to not just be a curator, not just because I love curating, obviously, too, um, but that I wanted, to, um, I wanted to be able to run an institution and be able to treat people differently than I had been treated. So, and I think that's our responsibility, is to step up and, and make things the way we want it to be. Yeah, be the change you want to see. Like, yeah, for sure. Not, you know, not like waving flags or calling attention or putting it on Twitter, but just doing the right thing. So, and um, doing the right thing so people see you do the right thing, so that they can also then do the right thing, so. Yeah, yeah, and like, I'm not gonna criticize anybody else's choices, but like, you know, I mean, for me, it was just like, like, what will make me happy in life? And I just thought, like, it, I, I've always felt that, or I always did feel that one thing that would make me happy in life is being a parent. And so, like, I just thought, like, you know, that, I want that. Like there, you know, no matter what, you know, because I just wanted to uh, share that, you know. And I sort of feel like, for me, you know, uh, it's funny because 
you know, the whole model of, of being an artist is, is, is one where selfishness, you know, is encouraged. Like, that notoriously, like, you, you, the selfishness, it's like, yes, you know, you're gonna, you are a selfish person, it's all about, and, and there's, uh, yes, that, that is kind of true. Like, uh, you know, I'm sitting there thinking about my work a lot, you know, um, and trying to get into that studio, like, ASAP, you know, and, 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 you know, having couples fights about, like, who got more time to do their own work today, you know, I mean, for serious, and, 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 you know, that kind of thing, but, I just sort of feel like I've equally found myself many, many times in places that my, I went because they were fun for kids, where I actually got a ton of inspiration. I mean, this whole video of Flushing um, was shot in the Flushing Mall out in, in Queens, where it was like we were taking the boys on like snowy February so that we could like get like hand pulled noodles and they could run around, you know? And so, I was like, I gotta bring my video camera out here. This place is crazy. And so I ended up going back to Flushing and we kept going back and back and, 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 and shooting video. And, and um, like, I found, my, I found my, my, my source in a place that I went because my kids wanted to go. You know, um, uh, 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 this other video with all the plastic toys um, came from buying a pinata uh, for a birthday and then being on some mailing list and constantly you know, be getting these mailers uh, from this company to buy more toys, and I ended up downloading all the JPEGs from their website and making this cameraless video. So it was like, you know, if I was just alone in my studio doing my thing 24-7, like, would that have come to me? You know, I, maybe, maybe not, but because I had these boys and was out in the world in places that they wanted to be, um, I learned stuff, and I saw stuff, and I, I, I got uh, to find stuff, gleaning stuff, following them around, that, um, that, that w ended up in the work. So, I, I mean, lucky me. Other questions? You know, the, the early videos that you're making, which have a very painterly quality in terms of the way that you're thinking about the color and composition and all of those issues. And then looking at the painting, which often functions in this kind of screen space, whether we're thinking about the idea of like the, the plexiglass, which looks like a screen, even like the rasters, which are themselves a kind of screen, silk screening, all of these, these media. And it strikes me that there's this kind of oscillation in between um, the, the kind of video space, like that flat space, and then kind of opening that space up into the world, but as an image. And I wonder if you can kind of talk a little bit more about that relationship between how that change started to happen for you between making video and making paintings. Because I know that they've always, you've always been doing both, but that there's been more, more and less tension at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's a good way to describe it, like more and less tension, because I think, you know, one thing I struggled with early on was, like, I felt like I had to, I was obliged to make a demonstration for people of how this went together. And this is kind of like, I guess, the bad side of, you know, the demonstration I was talking about, because I sort of felt like, you know, that the only way I was gonna like get away with this was to be like making a painting in real time on the video and then showing it right next to the video, you know? And so it became like, you know, a very much of like, um, uh, a, like, a, uh, like a set, you know? Um, like a kit or something. And I think like, you know, the most successful of those was, um, Kiss My Royal Irish Ass, this piece where like I did a performance where like I, I sat in green paint and made a butt print and put a stem on it and it was like a shamrock. So it was this whole play about identity and like the mark you make that like identifies you but like 
basically, okay, yeah, I'm Irish American, heritage wise, but like anybody could sit and paint and make a shamrock. And what does that say? So it was kind of like, you know, again, and both, neither nor, maybe so. And, but yet, yeah, that was like, oh, I got this print that's kind of like about print painting, and I did this performance. So it was like, it really was great. But then I tried to find other ways to do that, and it couldn't, you know, get the, the trick again. And so, like, then I was like, okay, these two have nothing to do with each other. And then I would just like make a video and then make the painting I wanted. And, you know, then, so it's kind of been like weaving like in and out, you know? But I guess I'll go back to also what I said earlier is like, um, like the video, I think of it as like, an, video is almost like, it's not a medium to me in a funny way. It's because of its liquidity, it's like water. It takes the shape that you pour it into. So if you're looking at a video on your phone, you know, it's like ice cubes, you know? It's just like poured into these little, you know, discrete cups. Whereas if, you know, you're like in a video installation, it's like a swimming pool. You know, it just go, it takes the form, it flows. And so it, it doesn't seem to have its own properties, no, the way I look at it. Um, it, 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 you can appropriate it, you know, animate it, etc. So it's very liquid that way. Whereas I feel like painting, you know, it has the demands, to me it has to have the satisfying demands of, of an object. So not just does it hang on the wall, but you know, you can look around the sides or at the edge or the surface or somehow it's coming into the into your space. Or it ha it's in your space, but it has its own space. Like. And I still, I guess, I, you know, kind of approaching that idea of believing in the aura of it, you know, which is, I don't think, a dirty word, you know. Like, it has this, it has its own, because sometimes, you know, the painting looks, I think it was like John Russell or something that says, like, the painting has to look back at you, you know. And I, I believe that, you know. It, it needs to have its own demands and that it looks back at you and tells you what it is. So, whereas the video is, is not playing exactly that game. So, I think, you know, they come apart, they go together. Um, and do you think that's maybe changed over time? Because I think that, that in terms of video, I often think, you know, we're watching it on TV, but now we're looking at flat screens, we're looking at tablets, we're looking at our, at our phone screens. And as those images have increasingly become objects that we're holding, mm, looking at in true. a different way, I wonder if that maybe might change things as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I um, you know, it's funny because, like, I've always felt like, yeah, I always have, like, some kind of, I guess, like, you could say, like, a prophylactic relationship with painting. Like, I always have uh, something between me and it, like a barrier, you know, between me and it. So sometimes it was, like, the video was kind of prophylactic to the painting, and maybe now I feel like the garments are kind of prophylactic to the painting. Like, it, it's the barrier that makes it possible, you know? So, uh, I, I think that, like, um, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I haven't made a video in a long time, but, like, I, one's coming, you know? I, I have some new ideas for one. Because now I really don't, like, n make a, now I feel like I'm at a place where, I, I, unless I really have an idea for a video, like it, it's not like a regular practice. I'm kind of more involved in in what I'm doing with the painting. But maybe because I've like with the the print on demand, like because I, I get like some of these, the, the 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 fabric is printed, and then I go to work on it. So I'm dealing with that image that's already there. So in a funny way, that kind of you know whether you want to call it like a ready-made or like it's already like like. The image is there, like the way you know you you turn on the camera and the image is there, you know. And then I'm, I'm so in a funny way, yeah. It, it, it's the, the relationship is the numerator and denominator. It keeps like flipping. So I think that's a a, a great place to end because I think it kind of sums up your work in in an interesting way, which is finding things that are already there but then calling attention to them in a way that enhances them and then thereby enhances us, not only just as viewers, but as, as humans. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.